Hey everybody, welcome to Chatbox. I'm David Cruz. It has been a crazy week in Trenton, even by Trenton standards. There's a massive new, the governor calls it the game changer bill on affordable housing that he celebrated this week, even as some say it's not going to change much. We'll talk to Republican Holly Shapizzi about it in our second half. But we got to start with the Democrats who thought moving on from Bob Menendez was going to be so fraught. Lawsuits against the line, blocking candidates getting into party conventions. It was a lot this week for the majority party. Joining us now to tell us how he's going to pull it all back together is the Democratic State Committee Chairman, Leroy Jones. Mr. Chairman, welcome back to Chatbox. Good to see you. Thank you, Dave. It's always a pleasure to be here, man. All right. Appreciate that. So, so you've been around for a bit. In, in the last two weeks, Oprah, the line lawsuit, Patricia Campos Medina and the Camden Convention, Steve Fulop, Attorney General Platkin. Have you ever seen two weeks so full of dramatic twists and turns? No, why would you think that? <laughs> <laughs> but no, right? I mean, not all of no, those things no, together. I'm, I'm just joking. I'm, I'm really joking. It, it, it's a lot of activity. And, uh, you know, look, this this typically happens when, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, these, these family fights. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, as time goes on, uh, you know, all heals wound, uh, all wounds heal. And, uh, you know, we'll, you know, we'll move it on. We'll be, you know, we'll be on to uh, the actual uh, primary election, uh, you know, certainly right after the filing date, which is Monday. And, uh, you know, and it's game on. So, I hope that, uh, you know, it will be a, an election that's based on the issues. Uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, they they haven't been. Uh, you know, it's been uh, a lot of discussion about the uh, the ballot uh, design and, uh, you know, the, the party line issue. Uh, and it's, you know, that's drowned, uh, you know, the very important core issues of what we should be talking to uh, our constituents and the voting public about. Yeah. So it started with Oprah. Uh, this was a bill that was supposed to relieve some of the burden on local clerks. Um, it was found to have tons of loopholes and the changes that were actually a burden on transparency. Uh, it was on a fast track on Monday and was tabled by Thursday. Who, who screwed that up? Uh, you know, look, your guess is good as mine. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the speaker's better judgment was at that time uh, you know, to uh, to hold a bill, you know, perhaps take a look at, uh, you know, some of the uh, the issues that were raised in, um, you know, in testimony to, uh, you know, ultimately do what the legislature does is to try to work out a, uh, a laudable, uh, um, you know, resolution uh, and, uh, you know, a bill that everybody can get behind. The other big story of the week, the case against the party line primary system, I want to talk about the statement that you made about it this week in a second, because that also made news. But let's hear from the governor uh, when we asked him about it this week, and then we'll come back and talk about it. The base case has always been that the attorney general is obligated to defend statute. And then my third part of the answer is the following. So I'm going to give you the same. The line came about for actually good reasons. You and I are neighbors. You work three jobs. I'm really into politics. Hey, can we? Can I find somebody who can be a proxy for me and and really who's un, who understands what's going on here? You look at a Middlesex County convention with 1,100 people, or Bergen County, or you name it. So I I I'm, I get why it's come into place, and I get the the value associated with it. But have I been open-minded from the get-go to tweaks that can make this system be even better than it is? Absolutely. And if the legislature uh, wants to proceed in that process, they can count on us for being good partners. So there was this marathon session on the suit uh, brought by Congressman Andy Kim on Monday. Uh, that was preceded by this surprise letter to the court from the attorney general calling the line unconstitutional and saying he's not going to defend it in court. You heard the governor there said, yeah, he's supposed to defend it in court. What did you think yeah. of that attorney general's letter? And, and did you take anything away from what you heard or, or read about the testimony in the case on Monday? So, uh, you know, the the um, the letter obviously, uh, you know, caught the attention of, uh, you know, of the judge. And, uh, you know, there was a, a bit of a admonishing, uh, you know, of the uh, attorney general yeah. uh, for being so late into the game. 
Uh, you know, I agree with the governor. I think the attorney general's uh, personal opinion should not necessarily be part and parcel of uh, this process. Uh, you know, his uh, you know job is to defend uh, the statutes in the state of New Jersey, and uh, you know it was it was a quite a surprise to everyone. Um, you know, I, I hate to say this, but, you know, because I know the attorney general personally it was a little short sighted on his part. Uh, you know, and uh, sometimes uh, you know things are just left well, you know, left alone, and that's well enough. But uh, you know, he opted to you know to take the action that he did, and I think he's, his hand got slapped. What is that that you were trying to say? in your statement this week ballot uniformity what what does that mean so uh so david if you look at uh you know ballot design across the state you have 21 different counties right you have 21 uh you know different um uh presentations of a ballot uh you know i believe that uh you know there you know there has to be uniformity uh you know across the state i believe that uh you know uh you know organizations you know regardless of who they are have the right to associate uh, with candidates of like interest and uh, you know and like mind, and uh, you know I do believe that uh, and I you know I was purposely staying away from trying to design a ballot because I didn't think that that was my role. Right. I was bring uh, you know just uh, input. So because I be, I believe since this the, the ballot situation that we're in right now is a creation of the legislature, then uh, you know that should go back to the legislature. You know, for um, you know, for a uh, an amending piece of legislation, and that should include uh, you know testimony from all advocates, engagement, full engagement from every uh, county clerk, uh, grassroots organization, members of the legislature. That's what we do here, and that's how you correct what exists in uh, the statute today. You know, by you know the amending features. So. In your statement, you said ballot uniformity. You didn't say uh, uniformity of this type of ballot, right? You, you're saying yeah. whatever we come up with, let's make sure that all the counties use it. That, that exactly what I was saying. What I also did not, uh, you know, did not, um, you know, suggest opposition to was the block ballot that folks are talking about. I, you know, again. Um, you know, I'm a believer in uh, the right to associate. I think that's a constitutional right. Uh, you know, I believe in the legislative process because that's where you get engagement from all segments of the community. And uh, and also, I think there needs to be a very expansive education program, you know, to the voters. Because, as you know, uh, if there's going to be change in uh, a ballot, uh, you know, there needs to be time to communicate that to the voting public. They need not walk into a uh, you know a voting booth uh, or look at a vote by mail ballot and see something totally different than they've never seen before. So I think we you know we have to give you know uh, due deference to the voters from an education standpoint with that. I think the legislature, if if not uh, you know this if this doesn't come out of the courts, I think the legislature has to move with uh, you know with deliberate speed to uh, you know to put something in place for our next, uh, you know, big election, and that's 2025. Right, so, but not for this one, which a lot of people will say, yeah, sure, you say, save it for the next one, because the candidate that you favor uh, really needs the line. I, you know, look, I, I don't think so, and I, I'm one of these individuals that, uh, you know, if there's a change right now, then uh, the playing field changes. I'm still putting the same team on the playing field, and we're going right. to play out of a playbook that, uh, you know, that looks for a victory. So I'm not one of these individuals that is afraid of, you know, any change. Yeah. I just believe that, uh, you know, there needs to be, uh, you know, time to, you know, to educate voters. I think we have the right to do that. I don't think they need to be surprised by anything. And, uh, you know, and again, ballot uniformity is something that should occur in every county. Nobody should be subject to, uh, you know, that ballot Siberia that we often hear talk yeah. about. That doesn't happen in the county that I'm in from Essex, but, uh, you know, obviously it's happened in other places. Those kind of things need to be cured. And those are the things that, uh, you know, I'm advocating for in, uh, you know, a legislative solution. So uh, I'm running out of time, but I do want to talk about the Senate primary, uh, which is the backdrop to all of this. Steve mm -hmm. Fuller pulling his support, not only pulling his support of Tammy Murphy, but telling her to drop out of the race. Uh, how much impact do you think that's going to have on this? 
Um, you know, look, I, I think people are uh, driven by their own convictions. I don't think, uh, you know, any one person, uh, you know, will have, you know, that level of influence. I thought it was surprising, uh, you know, that uh, a, um, a person would uh, flip on their endorsement, um, you know, and uh, why that occurs and, you know, what drove Steve yeah. Phillips to do what he did. That's probably a question for him. I, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, his press releases and, I still have question mark in terms of, uh, you know, the loyalty that one would have to, you know, that, that have would be questioned when, uh, you know, when you do something like flip flop and you do it consistently. Flip full up. Got it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he had some valid criticism of the Murphy campaign, though, stuff that people have been saying in private. Uh, his biggest criticism, I thought, was that she has not yet effectively articulated a rationale for her candidacy. Do you agree with that? Uh, you know, look, I, I, I think, uh, you know, she has. But as I said at the outset of, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, this segment, um, a lot of that has been blunted by the conversation around the line, the issues that, uh, you know, that define Democrats and uh, that define candidates, particularly Tammy Murphy, you know, have been drowned out by, you know, a whole lot of unnecessary rhetoric. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, we have to get beyond, uh, hopefully we'll get to a fix, uh, you know, shortly. And then we can get to the business of talking to voters about, you know, what's meaningful, uh, you know, for a candidate, how they're going to uh, serve, uh, you know, in the respective office that they're pursuing. Final question. The image of the Camden County Democrats, five white guys standing like this in front of this little a uh, Latina who's just trying to get in and, and function within a democracy. That's got to be the, the worst image of this entire campaign season, wouldn't you say? Uh, that was not a pretty picture. Uh, you know, if, uh, if that were my organization, uh, Patricia would have been, uh, you, know, it, you know, she would have been welcomed into the room uh, and given an opportunity to say whatever, uh, you know, she felt uh, a need to, uh, to, to address the audience. And uh, and I think when you when you do that, that becomes the story. And it and, it, and again, it blunts, uh, yeah. you know, the uh, you know, the, the candidates and, uh, you know, the issues that they'd like to talk about to define themselves. Yeah. It takes away from any discussion of issues. So, uh, and, yeah, yeah good point. All right. Democratic State Committee Chairman Leroy Jones. Chairman, always good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, David. And next time I will wear a tie, man. <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. It wasn't all terrible news for Democrats this week. Governor Murphy, Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin, and others were in Perth Amboy as the governor signed the big affordable housing bill. Even though the bill moved quickly through the legislature, this is an issue that has plagued the state for more than a generation. It also might not shock you to learn that not everyone thinks this law is good law. Holly Shapizzi is Republican senator who's been a longtime critic of affordable housing efforts, including this bill, and she joins us now. Senator, how you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you, David. You know, uh, I haven't been a critic of providing okay. affordable housing. It's Just more the, the how process, it was done. How, how we do it, and kind of doubling down on bad policy. Um, I've sat on this committee that's been grappling with this issue, uh, first in the Assembly, now in the Senate. I also have seen it from all sides. I've been a municipal attorney in my prior life. Um, I've also represented developers. I've been outside counsel to nonprofits that provide 100% affordable housing. And I think the biggest issue I have, other than the steamrolling it through um, in a very short window. There's been a lot of that this year. Oh, a lot of it. Yeah. And um, doing so in a fashion that really did not give stakeholders, i.e. the municipalities, um, really an ability to address and voice their concerns in a meaningful way. Um, the numbers and the magnitude of the numbers that we're dealing with are crushing. New Jersey is already the most densely populated state. People are still reeling from round three and the implications on their infrastructure, their communities, uh, traffic, all of it. And now we have an obligation that's been codified of almost an additional 90,000 
just affordable units that are supposed to be built in the next decade, primarily in suburban areas where you don't have the same sort of resources. You don't have public transportation. You don't have the school funding coming up from the state in the event that you need to expand your schools. And it, it kind of doubles down. And for me, the main concern I have is that the entire premise of Mount Laurel was based upon trying to right a historical wrong where uh, people of different minorities, people who were part of generational poverty were excluded from the process of being able to have home ownership. And the way that these get built necessarily, particularly because of the numbers, pretty much precludes that opportunity for affordable home ownership at any time in the future because everything that's being built is super high density, 100% rentals without any sort of home ownership opportunity for the very populations that we're claiming that we're trying to help. One of the things that this bill encourages is taking uh, former retail sites um, former kind of strip malls and um, uh, office parks and turning those into affordable housing. Uh, isn't that an option in Bergen where retail is kind of shrinking? Well, I mean, there's always the ability to repurpose. But if you're forcing these kind of phantom obligations on community by community, and we have 70 of them in Bergen County, with no thought to kind of regional planning, no thought to if you have two contiguous communities where you're forcing a thousand new units of housing into each simultaneously, where you have you know, two lane roads um, you know, or maybe a regional school, it really does have significant practical implications. I represent an area that has some of the most significant flooding concerns in the state because there's no place for the groundwater to go into. We're buying up properties pursuant to blue acres and under DEP, you know, ever-changing regs on, you know, one portion of the community. And then two blocks away, that same community, after they just bought out to try to alleviate some of the congestion and some of the flooding due to you know, these issues is now being forced to have to allow three, four, five hundred units. So, but, um, but what are you saying? Are you are you saying that um, only urban communities should take up the responsibility of affordable housing? Or are you saying that suburban <laughs> communities should be maybe uh, uh, made affordable for home sales? Well, it's uh, first off, urban communities get a pass. Yeah. And so what people don't understand is we fall into what's called region one. We are, our suburban communities are getting the affirmative obligations of Jersey City, of Hoboken, of Weehawken, of communities that have done billions and billions and billions of dollars of growth and high-end growth. Jersey City right now, their rents are amongst the highest in the nation, and they've built virtually no affordable housing over the past decade. Their obligations, based upon all that new construction that they did, none of which is affordable, most of it's gentrifying and kicking out people who had been in Jersey City forever because they can no longer afford to live there, their obligation is being passed off to the Paramuses of the world, the Westwoods of the world. And we are now having to absorb their obligation without any of the state resources yeah. that they receive the, to do so. The, the mayor there, by the way, this week testified and said that he wants to take uh, on that uh, requirement. He says that they shouldn't be exempted anymore, just as an FYI. Uh, so will there, are there going to be fewer legal challenges, do you think? No, unfortunately, I think this is going to start a whole new round of legal challenges. Um, one of my concerns from a practical perspective were the time frames that were put in this as well, because communities have affirmative obligations for in early 2025 to have these entire plans approved 
approved um, within, uh, I think, their first council meeting after reorg and seating new council members and potentially new mayors. They've got to affirmatively approve numbers that were given to their community by DCA. It's going to create a lot of chaos in the first quarter of 2025. Yeah. And, and the busiest people are always uh, the attorneys. So, um, <laughs> so let me ask you this on a couple of things that are unrelated uh, to affordable housing. This Oprah bill, um, not so much the pluses and minuses of it, more so do you think that the legislature uh, is going to be able to, to make new rules that make anybody happy? Uh, and the same with the line, which the leadership from both houses um, say that the courts don't need to fix. Let the legislature fix it first on Oprah and, and then on the line. So on Oprah, um, as we've seen as of late, even the most unpopular of ideas, maybe to the uh, public at large, uh, still managed to get through in the current administration. Um, you know, I personally, once again, wearing multiple hats, I've represented municipalities, I've seen Oprah get abused, um, and uh, particularly our clerks get abused by yep. people who take advantage of the system. So do I believe there needed to be some type of Oprah reform? Absolutely. Devil is always in the details, and I think there's probably going to be a couple of iterations that we see between now and we've been called back on April 15th for a you know, special voting session. And I could only assume that uh, that's going to be one of the bills that's on it. Um, it'll be interesting to see what it ultimately ends up looking like. What about the line? Um, do you think the legislature can, can fix that? Or do, so you, or do you think the line is, is a good idea? So I think there are the pros and cons on that. Um, we have seen with, and a lot of this is going to tie into the terrible quote unquote election transparency act, which is anything but, yeah. um, and the problem that we're going to have in New Jersey is without the line, it's going to be chaos. It's all going to be about whoever has the biggest super PAC that can circumvent, can shake down yeah. people to give them as much money as possible. And so now we're going to see the same level of money and kind of nastiness uh, it taking place in every primary um, with people being incentivized to put up phantom candidates, people being incentivized to put forth um, opposition pieces. We saw in my district, even Josh Gottheimer, um, last cycle, uh, there was a primary going on for the Republican side against Josh and Josh's super PAC went out and, and interfered in the Republican primary to try to sway people to one candidate. And I think we're going to see that throughout every primary in the state. Do I believe that people should end up in ballot Siberia? Absolutely not. Um, do I think it's kind of ironic and really hypocritical that some of the people who are thumping their chest and bringing these lawsuits are the very people who benefited from the line and never had any objections to it until they found themselves in a primary themselves? You know, I, I kind of call a little bit of nonsense on that as well. Yeah. All right. Don't ask the legislature to fix something that they just broke. <laughs> All right, Senator Holly Schapese, good to see you again. Thanks for coming on with us. Thank you, David. A programming note here, we will be hosting a special one-hour chat box in April, a conversation with the Democratic candidates for U.S. Senate. Not a debate per se. This will be a group chat with no opening statements and no debate rules, just real talk about issues affecting New Jersey and the nation. It streams Thursday, April 25th at 6 p.m., Three of the four candidates have agreed to participate, and some of you asked this week if we had excluded First Lady Tammy Murphy. The answer to that is absolutely not. We offered several dates and waited several weeks in an effort to accommodate Mrs. Murphy, but she has decided to make just one joint appearance, a debate on a New York-based network. Nothing we could do about that except to say that the door remains open to the First Lady. We'd love to have her. And if you see her on the campaign trail, please feel free to tell her that 
you would like to see her join us as well. We'll have more on this in the weeks ahead. And that's Chatbox for this week. Thanks also to Leroy Jones for joining us. You can follow me on X at David Cruz NJ and find web extras and full episodes when you scan the QR code on your screen. I'm David Cruz. For the entire crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at insidernj.com.